Now on BBC Two, leadership battles, internal plotting and the occasional sexual indiscretion. Alan Clark continues his history of the Tory party. At the start of 1957, the Conservative Party was in great disorder. The Suez affair had made them appear dishonest and, more dangerous for their electoral fortunes, incompetent. The Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, was in Jamaica, recovering from a nervous breakdown. Plainly, he was finished. How do you feel about Sir Anthony's resignation? Well, seeing the ill health that he is suffering at the present time, I think it was the only possible thing that he could do. I see. Have you got any opinions about the next Prime Minister? Well, I think that it should be Butler. And most people would have agreed with him. Rab Butler was Eden's deputy, a gentle intellectual on the left wing of the party, full of guile, but short on resolution. Rab was invited to address a meeting of the 1922 committee in room 14 of the House of Commons to boost backbenchers' sagging morale. But Harold Macmillan, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, arrived uninvited with Rab outside the committee room. Rab spoke first. At the end of a speech, members of the 22 traditionally banged their desks in approval. But Macmillan stood up to speak, uninvited, while the desks were still being banged. By the time he had finished speaking, he had established himself as a serious threat to Rab. MPs felt, with the party in so much trouble, something exceptional was needed, and Macmillan's acumen might just pull them out of the fire. Mr. Harold Macmillan becomes Prime Minister of Great Britain after Sir Anthony Eden's surprise resignation. A surprise even to his cabinet colleagues. Rav never until much later realised how devious Macmillan was, or indeed how hostile au fond to him, because apparently they were great friends on the surface got on very well together. And um, I, I don't think it ever struck Rab that there was this feeling of jealousy and hostility. But I never liked Macmillan from the very first. I never trusted him. On the morning of the Queen sending for Harold Macmillan as Prime Minister, he came in and told Rab, and when he'd gone, Rab uh, came out and said to me, it's not every man who's nearly been Prime Minister of England. Macmillan took over the helm of a government traumatised by the Suez debacle. I remember when he first uh, became Prime Minister, he wondered whether he would last six days, six weeks or six years. I don't know what, what I'll make of it, he used to say. You see, I'm no good as an actor. This, of course, was rather far from the truth, because he was, in fact, able to assume various um, personalities, uh, and um, he developed this uh, during the whole of his premiership. Macmillan was from a middle-class, lowland Scot background, although for some reason he used to pretend that they were Highlanders. He had married into one of the great landed families, and was a frequent guest at Chatsworth, his father-in-law's home. It was Macmillan's marriage that took him into another world entirely at Chatsworth and the Duke of Devonshire. And there's nothing wrong in that. I don't mean that as a criticism. But certainly in politics in, at that time, it still counted for a lot in the Conservative Party.
Macmillan deliberately and brilliantly took on the Lord of the Manor persona of an old-fashioned Tory. At a time of great uncertainty of the Britain's changing role in the world, he provided the country with a reassuringly avuncular leader. This Grousemore image was to serve Macmillan and the party well for the next six years. Well, when I was loading for Harold Macmillan, he was left-handed, and it was the first time I'd ever loaded for a left-hander, so I had to learn all the tricks of the trade to learn that. And uh, to load for them properly, you have cartridges in between your fingers, so as when you're shooting, all you do is take the gun off them, put the cartridges in, and pass the gun back. Uncle Harold, as they call him, was uh, a perfect shot and a perfect gentleman. Like many of his predecessors as Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan was an Etonian. He once joked that having twice as many Etonians in his cabinet as Attlee did meant things were twice as good under the Conservatives. Of all the Prime Ministers we are looking at, Harold Macmillan was the most successful judged at least by this key conservative criterion. He picked up a dreadful hand and played it so well that the party kept office for another eight years. It was mostly done with mirrors, of course, but the party and the country loved him, and he had an uncanny gift for anticipating political fallout, so that right up until the end, he almost always got it right. Britain has been great, is great, and will stay great, provided we close our ranks and get on with the job. Quite early in his premiership, Macmillan ran into trouble with the Treasury. Seared by his experiences of the 1930s, Macmillan was a Keynesian. He believed, that is to say, that government could, indeed should, spend money in order to generate growth. He and Keynes, incidentally, were both pupils of Eton, where Keynes used to help Macmillan from time to time with his essays. Three ministers disapproved, Thornycroft, Birch, and Powell. Well, I recollect that there was a growing dissent between the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. Macmillan never accepted the death of Keynes. He never accepted the monetary theory of inflation. He believed in a planned economy. He believed in planned prices and incomes. Tensions between Treasury ministers and their colleagues have bedeviled every Tory administration since. Margaret Thatcher once even blamed Macmillan's extravagance for starting the economic decline of Britain. And this attitude to government spending makes Macmillan far more left than new Labour today. But, faced with the choice between economic virtue and political survival, as nearly always in the history of the Conservative Party, it was no contest. On the 7th of January, 1958, Macmillan was due to leave for a Commonwealth tour. Choosing their moment carefully, the three Treasury Ministers all resigned together. It was Macmillan's response that first earned him the label, unflappable. He refused to change his plans, simply ordered his entire cabinet, what remained of it, to the airport to wave him off. It is always a matter of regret, from a personal point of view, when divergences arise between colleagues, but it is the team that matters and not the individual. Uh, and uh, I'm quite happy about the strength and power of the team. So I thought the best thing to do was to settle up these little local difficulties and then turn to the wider vision of the Commonwealth. Next, in a shameless and diplomatically disruptive coup de théâtre, Macmillan decided to visit Russia and get some photo calls with Khrushchev. The new television audience at home now saw their Prime Minister as an international statesman. 
the visit itself wasn't without its difficulties. In fact, uh, at one stage, Mr. Khrushchev deliberately absented himself from any meeting, saying that he had toothache. And uh, the atmosphere got pretty, pretty cool uh, to such an extent that Mr. Macmillan and Selwyn Lloyd spoke loudly in their um, private apartments of having to order the aircraft so that we could all return to London, um, knowing, of course, that these comments were being picked up by, by the Russian microphones. This worked very well because after a, a day or so, Mr. Khrushchev decided that he'd better resume meaningful discussions. And as he said to the Prime Minister, my toothache is now better. It has been cured by a British drill. Following two years of astute political management, Macmillan decided to call a general election. In October 1959, the Tories were returned with a majority over Labour of 107 seats. Whenever there is a swing to the Tories, it is because the party has found a way of reaching out beyond its automatic class constituency and appealing to the working class vote. In 1959, the floating working class voter wasn't just won over by Macmillan's one nation rhetoric or impressed by his debonair image. The economy was booming and as usually but not inevitably happens, during times of economic prosperity, the sitting government's popularity was high. And the new Tory voters of 59 had also been bribed in a giveaway budget earlier in the year that cut taxes and reduced the price of beer. The Commonwealth Institute in Kensington was built in 1962 to mark the transition from Empire to Commonwealth. The Second World War had made the loss of the British Empire inevitable. But Macmillan's attitude was pragmatic. Rather than resist the tide of history, it was better to ride with it. But it remains nonetheless an extraordinary tribute to his managerial skills that the party was able to cope with the loss of something that had been central to its identity for the last hundred years. In 1960, Macmillan toured Africa to sell the Commonwealth the New World Order. His speeches were written by David Hunt. I put in a remark pointing out that a number of changes were taking place in Africa. The wind of change is blowing right through Africa, was the expression I used. I do remember when I was writing it, an idea was passing through my mind of the final scene of storm over Asia. It ended up with all the uh, imperialists and the priests and the generals and so on being blown away in a great hurricane uh, with the hero leading a charge. The phrase echoed round the world. Macmillan had now made it clear in one line that he would not act to block the ending of the British Empire. The next problem for the Prime Minister was also inseparable from Britain's changing role in the world. Macmillan, the great salesman, had to sell Britain to Europe, and he had to sell, or try to sell, Europe to the party. This he did by depicting Europe as a kind of multilingual new dominion. Macmillan met with de Gaulle at Rambouillet to discuss Britain's entry into the common market. Macmillan, who during the war had bossed de Gaulle around, that man with a head like a pineapple and hips like a woman, thought that he could handle de Gaulle. He failed to see that much had changed. De Gaulle was all powerful and couldn't be handled. And in January 1963, he was to veto Britain's entry into Europe. 
the vast majority of the party were upset to the extent that they didn't like the idea of anything being vetoed. I mean, Britain being vetoed was, was a setback, but it was not a, a, a matter of fundamental importance to the party as a whole. In July 1962, Macmillan felt his ratings to be slipping a bit. There was much discussion in the smoking room about possible successors. His response was swift and resolutely Stalinist. He sacked seven members of his cabinet, including his Chancellor of the Exchequer, Selwyn Lloyd, everyone, in fact, who might conceivably be a threat to his leadership. The sheer ruthlessness of this purge shocked commentators and terrified colleagues. Selwyn was Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he'd been Foreign Secretary during the long years of uh, Suez and Eden and Macmillan. So he was thought to be one of the key pillars of the government. And he was also somebody who was very important to the government in the sense that he was outside the magic circle world of the Grossmoor image. I think there was always a touch of condescension in Macmillan's attitude to Selwyn Lloyd. Uh, from Selwyn Lloyd's point of view, there was, I think, an absolute, almost canine fidelity and loyalty, perhaps too much so. Uh, Selwyn used to refer to Macmillan as master. Selwyn was a lonely man. His work was his life. He didn't have other interests. So uh, to be thrown out in this uh, pretty brutal way did come as a major emotional and personal blow. I mean, most resignations hurt, but um, I think Selwyn's resignation hurt more deeply than most. There is a widely accepted idea that the Night of the Long Knives, as it came to be called, weakened Macmillan's position and showed him up as panicky and out of touch. This is a fallacy. A government that had been starting to look stale was now invigorated with fresh blood. And if this involved the infliction of pain on colleagues, well, this just made Macmillan look ruthless and decisive. One of those beheaded, the sacked Lord Chancellor David Kilmuir, complained when they later met at a dinner that his cook would have been given more notice of dismissal. Macmillan replied, it's easier to find a Lord Chancellor than a good cook. Profumo was the war minister. He was having an affair with Christine Keeler, who was simultaneously enjoying a liaison with the Russian military attaché. This was apparently a shock to party managers, but it can hardly have been unexpected. Profumo, according to Westminster gossip, only went to bed to exercise. Andrew Rock broke the story. I heard about it from uh, Henry Kirby, who was a conservative NP. And when he provided me with this note uh, from Profumo uh, to Christine Keeler, uh, I had no doubts about its authenticity. He was giving me this because he disliked Profumo as a part of the upper class Tory establishment and they treated him as, as an outsider. He, he was not part of what he called the kissing ring. Questions were asked in the press and in the house and after a botched attempt at a cover-up, Profumo resigned. Once the story was out, Macmillan handled it with great aplomb, fielding his party chairman, Lord Hailsham, a political bruiser with an impeccable high church background. Silly to talk about not being interested in Mr. Profumo's morals. Mr. Profumo's morals are a great public issue. But to try and turn it into a party issue is really beyond belief contemptible. 
Do you feel that the, those who've spoken out, the bishops, the times, and so on, have tried to turn it into a party? I think you have. Thank you, Lord Hill. Although there are occasions, 1997 being an example, when financial sleaze can damage a government's fortunes, the electorate like reading about sexual sleaze and don't really care. Macmillan himself was unscathed by the whole affair. He had behaved honourably, and if at times he'd seemed a little out of touch, well, that was just his patrician camouflage. In any case, the Tories nearly won the next election, and that was after substituting for Macmillan someone who was palpably out of touch. The Tory conference is the annual forum at which the party in the country meets and talks to the parliamentary party. It is a common fallacy to believe that because everything is stage managed and fixed in advance, this can have no effect on policy. Untrue, policies are often moderated or even altered in the light of feeling expressed at conferences. But also, and sometimes more significantly, they are used as an arena where the possible contenders for the leadership display their appeal, some brazenly and some with a more subtle technique. The Conservative Party must be the party of law and order. In all the annals of the party, the most dramatic conference was that of 1963. Macmillan had fallen ill. His own doctor was on holiday and the locum diagnosed cancer of the prostate. And Alec Douglas Hume read the Prime Minister's resignation to a startled conference. It is now clear that whatever might have been my previous feelings, it will not be possible for me to carry the physical burden of leading the party at the next general election. There were several who fancied themselves as candidates to fill the vacancy for this succession. But the process of selection was clandestine. There was no provision even for taking a vote of MPs. As soon, which was very soon, that Macmillan had had his operation, it was discovered that he didn't have cancer at all. He greatly regretted what he had done and set about trying to fix the succession. At the time, the Tory party chose its leaders behind closed doors by taking soundings until a consensus emerged. But now the grandees were forced to decide on the succession in the middle of a party conference. And of course, immediately, who now? And there was sort of a dozen of us involved in all this. And we were in and out of each other's bedrooms. The wives got furious. They'd be dressing for a cocktail party. They'd suddenly find four men sitting there drinking whiskey. I mean, it was intolerable for the women. Or they'd be half asleep, and then three men would come tumbling into the bedroom, carry on with the conversation they'd started somewhere else. When we arrived at the conference, there were these people rushing about with little cues for Quintin, uh, for people to put on their lapels and that sort of thing. And then there was uh, another party for um, Reggie Maudling. And of course there was a solid party for Rab. And it just never occurred to me that Rab wouldn't succeed. Harold Macmillan's original but covert message was if you want to win the election, hold your nose and go for Quentin. He said he wanted me to be his successor. And uh, I was absolutely flabbergasted uh, at this. But I realized, of course, uh, that when the prime minister says this to you, you've got to take it seriously. But I ought to, to say tonight uh, that my intention is, after deep thought, to disclaim my peerage. I waited until the end of the meeting when the vote of thanks was uh, presented. And uh, then I said I had decided to disclaim my peerage, which of course sent everybody crazy and waving their arms and shouting. I was embarrassed by the whole scene of being at the center of it. 
And if I can find anyone uh, to receive me as a candidate to stand at an early moment for the lower house. Before you end into this, the chief whip said to me, I have to intimate to you that you and I are on the platform and uh, at the appropriate moment, Quentin Helsham will announce my hat is in the ring and there will be uproar. Everyone will rise and cheer. And he said, I think that as members of this administration, we should not rise and cheer. We will stand, but not applaud. <laughs> well, I kept looking around. I felt I ought to do something, but I didn't. I kept my hands tight. <laughs> Hailsham was flashy, shameless, and voluble. He was a showman, too quick on the draw, a kind of high church Heseltine. But the party doesn't like its leaders in waiting to be so flagrant. I think kissing babies as a member of parliament is one thing. Parading your baby when you're aiming to become leader of the party is quite another. By the Thursday of conference week, Macmillan had decided to swap peers in midstream and to back Alec Douglas Hume. Rap Butler was devastated. Twice now his aspirations had been thwarted by someone he thought was a close friend. Macmillan refused to speak to Rab. Rab telephoned the, the nursing home and he refused to speak to him. He was determined that he wasn't going to be succeeded by Rab. He said once in a broadcast, which is an absolute lie, we tried to push it Rab's way, but of course it was no good. Well, I mean, it's a complete and utter lie. He was such a devious, strange man. Perhaps Macmillan, like many condemned leaders before and since, dreamt of making a comeback. If he allowed Rab or Quentin to succeed him, they would be impossible to dislodge. Alec was made of softer stuff. A mild irony to date is that Douglas Hume had been Neville Chamberlain's principal aide during the Munich crisis, a time when Macmillan himself had been the most radical of anti-appeasers. A good example of the fact that while memories in politics are often long, they can, when necessary, shorten dramatically. Lord Hume has been invited to form a government. The Foreign Secretary was called to Buckingham Palace for a 40-minute audience with the Queen. Alec Douglas Hume was, naturally, what Macmillan assumed by posture. Genuinely aristocratic, he was to be a throwback to an earlier Tory era. He was, of course, an old Etonian, but whereas Macmillan had been a sickly scholarship boy who left early, Douglas Hume had played cricket for the school been elected president of the Eton Society and finished by marrying the headmaster's daughter. He was an attempt, aberrant almost, by the Tory party to fight fire with water to counter Wilson's contemporary appeal with a reversion to the traditional Tory image. <laughs> failed just when Alec lost the 1964 election by the smallest of margins. This failure was to determine the electoral strategy and social composition of the Conservatives for the rest of the century. <laughs> Douglas Hume resigned following his election defeat. Everywhere, it seemed, was a new breed of Tories looking for a new breed of leader. If we're going to win the next genera uh, general election, then we must look for a new, young, lively man who can lead the party in the way that uh, Howard Wilson led the Labour Party in the last general election. Who would you like to see succeed him? Edward Heath. Which you put your money on? <laughs> Heath, actually. <laughs> In 1965, the party changed its system, and for the first time, MPs elected their leader. Yellow ticket number 32. 
It started decorously enough, but what a lot of trouble was in store. I think there were a lot of younger members who had found the, the labor attacks on the, the old moth-eaten image and the grassmoor image and all this sort of thing actually quite difficult to cope with. And although we all had immense respect for Alec Douglas Hume, uh, it was rather a part, an era of the past. So that here was Ted coming from uh, a, a completely different background and, and still with some of his own original accent, symbolizing the new Conservative Party. Heath grew up in Broadstairs on the south coast. Having failed with the patrician, the Conservatives were now looking for a replica Wilson. Heath seemed to fit the bill. A grammar school boy, hard working, clever but not too clever. His school report for economics reads, the subject is difficult for him. And although he has gained a knowledge of the principles, I doubt his ability to apply them. His leadership started unfortunately. Labour won the 1966 general election with an increased majority. Heath rang Jim Pryor for advice on his shadow cabinet. We've now got to decide about our statutory woman and um, what you think. So I said, well, uh, I've no doubt in my own mind that uh, it ought to be Margaret Thatcher. And there was a long sort of pause down the telephone. And, uh, oh, um, well, we've thought about that. Uh, but Willie says that if we have her, we'll never be able to get rid of her. Keeping the party in line when you're in opposition is always harder than when you're in government, if only because you dispose of less patronage. One of Heath's first problems came in the person of Enoch Powell, his shadow defence secretary. Powell had resigned from Macmillan's government in 1958 at the time of the little local difficulty. Now he started to cause trouble for Heath. For some time, he had been arguing a program of radical free economics, and no one had paid much attention. But now, all of a sudden, he found a cause that aroused immense popular support. The discrimination and the deprivation, the sense of alarm and of resentment, lie not with the immigrant population, but with those among whom they have come and are still coming. This is why to enact legislation of the kind before Parliament at this moment is to risk throwing a match onto gunpowder. I'm utterly surprised that this speech, which I delivered to my, as a constituency member in the constituency area, was so taken up, it express something which people wanted to express. The speech was a calculated attempt to twist Heath's tail. Enoch was gambling on getting enough popular support to present himself as a right-wing alternative to Heath. And he was enormously popular. The BBC World at One radio poll made Wilson the man of the decade, but Powell came in at number two ahead of President Kennedy. Enoch had played the race card, which always terrifies the establishment. But Heath was glad of the excuse to get rid of him. And many were pleased to see the back of so populist and uncongenial a colleague. I, of course, found it impossible to defend him and was totally in favor of Ted Heath's very brave action to say he had to leave the Shadow Cabinet. I, and I'm sure others, would have left the Shadow Cabinet if Ted hadn't sacked him. It was intolerable to us that he should have been one of our colleagues. And Drewing always says, without a word to anybody, make a provocative speech of that kind. Now the Tories had to win an election. On the 30th of January 1970, the Shadow Cabinet met to discuss strategy 
at Selsden Park Hotel in Croydon, a venue more accustomed to sales conferences than high-level politicking. Edward Heath was, and by inclination, had always been a corporatist. But at Selsden, a new message came across. The Tories were now tough fundamentalists on the economy. Although for some junior Conservatives, this may have had within it an element of wishful thinking. I was enormously encouraged by the Selsden Manifesto. It seemed to me here at last was a Conservative Party that was willing to tackle some of the problems with which the former Conservative government had failed to deal with. Very exciting, firm, clear, market orientated policies. After this weekend here, the Conservatives will be ready for an election at any time. They're working towards the slowing down of the pace of rising prices. The reform of industrial relations, and that means making contracts between employers and workers legally enforceable. As for the economy, well, the, broadly speaking, the Conservatives would like to get away from the idea of subsidies to industry and back to independence and profitability. And in 1970, against all prediction, Ted Heath won the general election with a majority of 30. Our purpose is not to divide, but to unite. And where there are differences, to bring reconciliation, to create one nation. The period of the Heath government, almost from its outset, remains one of the most frustrating and melancholy interludes in the whole history of post-war conservatism. The explanation is simple. With the sole exception of taking the country into Europe, Heath really had not the slightest idea of what he wanted to do. He made great play of modernization, and the term is innocuous enough, but his objectives were often couched in language so obscure as to mislead the author as well as the audience. Essentially what Sir Edward does is to make the job uh, ten times more difficult than it should be. Concertos are a particular problem, particularly, say, a piece like the Rococo variations, which I remember we uh, did with him, uh, full of little rubati and um, little pauses and sudden changes of tempo. Well, he was completely at sea. It is hard now to remember just how powerful and disruptive the unions were in the 1970s. Britain lost over 16 million working days a year through strike action and was known as the sick man of Europe. Heath hoped to cure this with legislation and asked Robert Carr to draft an industrial relations bill to bring the unions into line. This is a fair deal for all who work in industry and for the country as a whole. And this bill will, I believe, be history in the making. But they didn't have the muscle, political or economic, to meet the unions head on and win. What I never believed was that the trade unions would refuse to negotiate. I thought they would always negotiate. And that in our proposals, we had set up a deliberate negotiating position. And there were areas, particularly in the areas of registration, where I would have been ready and almost glad to make some compromises. But I couldn't make compromises when they wouldn't come to the negotiating table. Because the Conservative Party had its right wing to cope with, just as the Labour Party had its left wing to cope with. It was a hard battle, and I had some supporters as well as some opponents. And of course they took to the streets, and I had my house bombed. It was a rough game. I have to say that I think that um, Ted Heath was 10 years ahead of public opinion. Public opinion was not prepared in 1971, 72, 73 to give the support to the government in industrial relations legislation and in curbing the excessive power of trade unions 
which they were prepared to give to Margaret Thatcher in 1980 and 81. The irony of Heath's government is that its single achievement did more harm to the party and arguably to the country than all its failures. Heath had seen what Europe had done to Macmillan and once de Gaulle was off the scene, he set about getting Britain into the community as fast as was possible. Yet another example of a politician learning the wrong lesson from history. And in February of 1972, the Tory whips pushed the entry bill through the House of Commons. On New Year's Day of 1973, Britain became a fully-fledged member of the community. But much had been said on both sides that would haunt the party until the millennium. And all too soon, the hard realities of a creaking economy reasserted themselves. When unemployment started to go up, and we decided we would pursue what I suppose were then called Keynesian measures to reflate the economy, to bring unemployment down. And there was nobody in the cabinet at all who was dissented from this. And the way we did it was to increase public expenditure in spheres which were create a lot of employment. And the two biggest spheres were the two departments of Margaret Thatcher and Keith Joseph. This expansion in government spending was later demonized by Margaret Thatcher as Heath's U-turn. I think that the alleged U-turns, and they were U-turns in, the, in the last part of the government, is a reaction which I believe is an essential part of a conservative, pragmatic approach. Events that happened which could not be denied, and one had to react to those events. And the longer-term policies had to be put on one side and even distorted for the short-term necessity. Unsurprisingly, inflation and wages rocketed. The crunch came when the miners, traditional bane of Tory administrations, went on strike for higher wages. The country was on the verge of chaos, held ransom by the NUM. Even the cabinet had to meet by candlelight, and Heath felt he had no choice. He caved in, gave the miners everything they wanted. And then, just as it seemed that things could get no worse, the Middle East war broke out and the price of oil quadrupled. The miners came back with another huge pay claim. This time, Heath resisted. He introduced a three-day week. He introduced petrol rationing. And then, almost it seems, because he had no idea what else to do, he called a general election. Now, I know a lot of people have been asking, what will an election prove? The answer is this. An election gives you, the people, the chance to say to the miners and to everyone else who will wield similar power in Britain, times are hard. We are all in the same boat, and if you sink us now, we will all drown. The 1974 election campaign in February, of course, was a direct consequence of the government's inability to deal with the miners' strike. And uh, we went into that election, and it was certainly partly, at least, on the program of asking the electors the question, who governs? Not unnaturally, if a government asks the electors who governs, the electors are likely to say, not you if you didn't know. But nobody's saying that anybody can form a firm government. Let's go and see how all this news is being taken in Trafalgar Square with Desmond Wilcox. To you as a housewife, does it matter who gets in tomorrow? I should say, I think it matters a lot. I think if the Tories get back, the prices will shoot up. And we'll never be able to buy as many things. The resulting parliament was hung, although Labour were the largest party. Heath very reluctantly moved out of Downing Street. Some Conservatives wanted to get rid of him immediately. Another election was imminent. But Heath had closed his mind to any new ideas. 
Uh, if things don't go quite right, he doesn't actually realise that, uh, that it's really him. He can't quite understand always, and so he, he, gets, um, he gets a little bit arrogant, or, you know, and if the tempo's sound, you say, move it, move it. Now the party knew that it was time for a change, and defeat was moving them to the right. Keith Joseph had discovered monetarism, and he burned with zeal. He argued that we must resist the ratchet effect, which arose because socialists were committed to moving the agenda leftward, while conservatives were content with the status quo, whatever it might be, at the time. If we could reverse this trend, then it would be Labour who had to apply the ratchet, while Conservatives were deciding which way the wheel must turn. Profit is the source, profit is the source of investment, the source of secure jobs, the source of revenue for the social services, and the only way to raise the standard of living. It was only after we lost that election that suddenly Keith came out with a major speech upon monetary policy um, and suggesting that the volume of a particular ingredient in money supply would cure all the world's evils. In October 1974, Wilson called another election to get a stronger mandate for his Labour government. The Tories lost again. The pragmatic political party, whose raison d'etre was government, whose shining ability was its tenacious grip on power, was on a losing streak. October 1974 was the absolute nadir of the party's fortunes, and there didn't seem to be anyone or anyone on the horizon to pull things out of the fire. It was quite clear that Ted Heath was a loser and um, would have to go. And we looked for other candidates, and at first, I must say, with many others, I looked to Keith Joseph. Keith ruled himself out. And it gradually became clear that the one who'd got the courage to do it and who'd got the intellectual ability to do it was Margaret Thatcher. Of course, there were snags. First of all, she was a woman. Do you think the country is really ready even in two or three ti years' time, for a, a woman Prime Minister? Very much so. I think they should look at the extremely successful record of women Prime Ministers. It's been marvellous. They've done wonders. The young protégé of Keith Joseph was recognised as a rising star, but surely her time had not yet come. She was a complete outsider, 50 to 1 at Ladbrokes, meant to clear the way for the heavyweights, Whitelaw and Pryor at the second ballot. When Margaret Thatcher went to Ted Heath's office in the House of Commons to tell him of her intention to stand against him, his manner was typical and graceless. He neither invited her to sit down nor stood up himself. All he said was, if you must, you'll lose. 